Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman and welcome to OpenJS World. Uh, I was told to give a keynote, but rather than me talking for a long time with evocative stock photography and inspirational stories, I thought a better idea would be to bring people who are much more interesting and much more competent than I to the stage. So I'm going to be thrilled to introduce our panelists for this wonderful panel, Getting Hired. So again, I am Scott Hanselman. Uh, to my left, we have Jerome Hardaway from Vets Who Code. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Scott. Uh, in the lower corner here, down here, we have Zainab Ibrahimi, CEO at Flourish. Hello. Hey, thanks for having me. And then right down here, we've got uh, Saran Yitbarak, uh, founder of Code Newbie, as well as other ventures, and just general positive enabler on the internet. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great, thanks for having me. Cool. So this panel uh, wants to kind of talk about getting hired, uh, decode a little bit about it. We're in the middle of, a, you know, in the middle of a Panera Bread, in the middle of a panini. Some people find that uh, an offensive joke. I find it funny every single time. I don't care whether you think it's a bad thing or not. Uh, we're in a really difficult time right now, both uh, in tech, we're having growing pains as a, wor as a world. Uh, we're separated and not all in person at OpenJS World right now. Uh, and getting hired is really hard. Every time I hear about someone losing their job in the middle of this pandemic, uh, I think to myself, wow, this is a really rough, a rough time to be doing that. Uh, Zainab, have, have people uh, been coming to Flourish for, for coaching and uh, being better at getting, uh, getting hired during this time? Yeah, you're, what you're saying is absolutely right. It is a lot harder during this time. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of people struggling to get jobs a lot, a lot more than uh, we had in last year. Um, I think things are going to get better. I'm, I'm feeling very hopeful that um, come the summer um, and the trend, especially here in, in the US, um, is going like things are going to get better. But yeah, it's been a struggle. And um, mostly it has to do with the hesitancy of a lot of companies to hire uh, more junior um, engineers or more entry level engineers and like setting a bar extremely high. Um, there's like one anecdote that I'll share. Um, I, I saw a job posting and, and I've actually this has happened a lot where um, there's a job description for an entry level position um, asking for five years of experience. And so it's a little <laughs> it's a little rough out there for sure. Yeah. Saran, you've dedicated a lot of your career to help people who are, you know, early in career be successful. It seems like there's a bit of a haves and have nots between there's like people who have 20 years experience and they may have finding trouble finding jobs because of ageism and people who are just getting started who can't get anyone to take a chance on them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think one thing that's been really encouraging in recent years is moving away from calling them junior developers to early career developers. I think that slowly we're becoming a little bit more open minded as to, you know, the different skill levels we're willing to accept in developer positions. And I think just starting with naming is a good sign that we're moving in the right direction. I've also seen uh, titles like associate developer, which is also encouraging because mm -hmm. it kind of establishes the career ladder, you know, a little bit sooner, a little bit earlier in someone's career. And I find that really encouraging. So I think that we are, I think we're very, very far away from getting to where we want to be, but I can see kind of baby steps in incorporating and introducing people with just one or zero years of experience into the official ladder uh, at a tech company and at an engineering team. Mm -hmm. One of my bosses has said uh, that when you're putting together a basketball team, you can't teach height, but everything else can be taught, ball handling, rules of the game, and all those kind of things. And he is consistently surprised that we don't hire for height because honestly, you know, oh, you don't know Ruby? That's fine. We'll teach you Ruby. You don't know C Sharp? We'll teach you C Sharp. Uh, Jerome, you work with veterans and upskilling those veterans. Why don't people teach? Why don't people hire like that? Um, I think, especially what I'm seeing in the market right now, I just think it's. If I'm being 100 percent honest, I'm thinking it's a, it's a little bit of uh, trying to hedge the bets in their favor, and you know, just laziness, right? We, I've been on this remote journey of being able to educate and upskill people remotely for six, seven years, right? So I, I have that experience. A lot of people, especially we're not truly doing it remote first or doing it on, you know, in a pandemic. So it's not like 
real remote work where you, you know, you can work from home and then you like, you know, go to the beach and then everybody's happy and stuff. It's like, oh, you know, I'm going to put on a mask and wash my hands like for 45 seconds because, you know, I don't want to get sick. So it's a different mindset and people are just not thinking from it like in that, like in that aspect when it comes to hiring and like working with remote workers. I, I spoke last week to a company that had 200 entry level jobs just on backfield. Just like, you know, we're just going to wait till the world opens up when my senior software engineers, so my my alumni who are getting there going for their second jobs, so when they come to me and they ask me to like help them with it, they're getting hired within weeks and they're getting upwards to like the salary plus like 20, 30, 50% more than what they asked for. I have a veteran mm. who just came, he's in he's in uh, Seattle, but he just got a job in uh, Nashville and he's getting paid 50% above the average salary of a senior front end engineer there. So it's a real, like, it's a really crazy market right now, particularly for those who are senior, they're able to get, you know, they're getting snatched away hotcakes and they're getting a lot more money than they're asking for. While juniors, they're having to almost be like small versions of DevRel, and they're having to really showcase mm. those skills to ins to instill that social equity to you know get companies to you know take a chance on them. Yeah, it feels like the uh, the the bell curve, the standard bell curve, is kind of inverted right now, and we're seeing very very early in career and very very senior people, and everyone is having a challenge right now getting someone to take a chance on them. And to your point, we're all remote. So I guess we won't hire a junior, excuse me, pardon me, an early in career or an emerging developer uh, because we don't have the time, the patience, perhaps we're, we're too lazy to really invest in them. I can't sit with that person and give them that love that they need. That in, And on, honestly, the ability to fail. I think that we don't give early in career developers a safe place to fail fast and often without judgment. We call it grace in like my community. Like you have to be able to give people grace. Like we demand, we demand a level of perfection that we can't obtain from the juniors that we didn't have. And when it's particularly when you go to like middle and senior engineers, they are. I've seen it in my community a lot where people are demanding a level of capabilities. I'm like, do you not remember how, like when we first got in this community, how easy it was to get in? Like all you had to do was know bootstrap and jQuery. Like now it's a front end. You can't even like, you need to know a front end framework. You need to understand APIs. You mm -hmm. need to uh, like be able to tell the difference between several front end CSS frameworks from bootstrap to foundation to tailwind. It's not the same. So we have to give people grace. If I may, that's an excellent um, segue. Let me ask you this, Zainab, uh, that list of skills that Jerome just rattled off, which is large. What do early and career developers feel when they see that like, this is the stack you need to make a web page? Yeah, it's pretty overwhelming. I think what we've been seeing a lot uh, with the people that we're, we've been talking about is like a lot of anxiety and feeling like um, they're not good enough, right? And I find that that mentality sometimes even hinders their ability to really get through the interview process, right? Because when you're going, the interview process in itself is already extremely hard, right? You're like put on the spot, you have to talk to people. It's really anxiety inducing in itself. But then if on top of that, you feel like, you know, there's so much to learn. There's so much to know. And I'm expected to know all of these things all at once in order to prove myself in order to get this job that I really want. And I like to reframe that a little bit in the sense that if you can code, you can learn. And this industry, it's all about learning. Nobody is perfect. Nobody knows it all, right? Like I've been in the industry for 10 years, almost 10 years. And there are so many things that I don't know. And it's like more about being comfortable with the idea that you will not know, but that you can convince someone. And, and first of all, convince yourself that you can pick up any framework that comes around. You know what I mean? Like you can learn. And that is the type of stuff that uh, gets you hired, right? Being able to demonstrate that you can, you're resourceful, that you can learn, that you're driven. And I think that um, that's, that's the focus that we should be having really, because the amount of frameworks and technologies and tools that are gonna come up are gonna continue to grow, right? And that should not be the focus. Um, if you can code, you can pretty much pick up um, any of those things along mm -hmm. the way. 
So Ron, in your career, you have been very much as someone who empowers and wants people to think about the system as opposed to thinking about the individual line of code. Is that important what Zainab is saying to like learn how to learn is the most important skill that people have to have right now in today's job market? I think so. I think the other thing is to learn how to focus. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to all kinds of strangers all over the world um, and just, you know, offering my two cents and trying to be helpful um, and giving feedback and perspective on their, you know, job hunts and their learn to code journeys. Um, and one of the things that shows up over and over again is just people just bouncing around and being all over the place and their inability to, you know, to, to or their not inability, but their struggle to learn um, isn't because they literally can't learn. It's because they feel, as Aziz said, overwhelmed and they feel all over the place and they feel like, oh, you know, I hear about this new framework. Okay, let me jump to this real quick. Oh, two weeks pass. Oh, no, there's another framework. Okay, let me go to this. And they're jumping around so much and so frequently that they get nothing done. And then feeling like they get nothing done makes them feel stupid and that they can't learn. And then there's this vicious cycle. So I feel like, you know, it's not just learning how to learn, but learning how, um, as Jerome just put it in the chat, learning how to plan and learning how to stick to a plan and believe in the plan, um, kind of trusting the process, I think is something that is understandably very, very difficult for something that's as hard as coding. But I think that's a really big problem that I've seen. I really like um, th what I'm seeing in, uh, in in social media with with younger people, and I mean literally younger in age, uh, using technology in a way that is creative so that they can have accountability partners. There's a young woman on TikTok named Medical Cat with a K. She streams herself studying so that others might normalize studying for three or four hours at a time. So she puts her phone there and she studies, she plays music, she does Pomodoros, and then every 25 minutes she takes a break and she addresses the live audience. And it's mostly hmm. just chill and vibe and learn with Kat. And I think to myself like, wow, I would never have that ability to, to be that organized, to be that disciplined, to be that planned. But what's cool about it is that you're watching her um, be dedicated to a thing. And it's like, well, if, if this internet stranger is being open and positive and empowering, then maybe I'll plan my study and we'll, we'll, we'll do it together. We'll study together. And uh, having those 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 partnerships, as opposed to traditional mentorships, which is just old person lectures young person, I think is a, is, is a new way to think about studying and planning, especially in public. Um, Jerome, now you have put together Vets Who Code for many years now, and uh, it's not necessarily a mentorship program. There's a lot of peer, you know, people mentoring each other kind of work as well. How do you make sure that it's not just you hold court uh, you know, uh, regularly and tell them what you know? Uh, how do I make sure? Um, well, just, how do I best, pay this, best way to say this? I feel like I have an unfair disadvantage in the education place, right? I am my people, right? The people that come through Vetsuko, they're usually people who, you know, they were on the front lines and battlefields and stuff. And that's who I was. So mm. uh, in the military, they would call us like first term troops, like uh, the E4 mafia. So the lower ranking people, <laughs> and I'm one of them. So it's like, I know where they come from. So I'm a part of the gang and I'm able to talk to them in their language and be able to come from a fire team format of like, yo, we, this is how we're gonna do this. Like, you all speak right, your language. Yes, exactly, right? We, I can come in talking to them the way they've already been trained. And it just, it just resonates, right? And mm -hmm. they understand because from my background, I have, you know, in, I have enough experience to where most of the most of the guys and girls who are in infantry are like Aaron, who uh, she was an EOD and or just explosive ordnance disposal because she didn't want to jump out of planes. So she chose bombs over planes to swallow me. Uh, <laughs> but what I'm hearing you though, is that what you're saying is because you are a time shifted version of them, you're them in the future. Yes, that proves it. that it's possible, and then they can run in the direction that you're running. And you, and I think that's it. the biggest, like, yeah, I think that's the biggest secret. Like, you know, I'm, I think I'm the only code school guy that's not like, you know, I don't have fancy masters or anything like that. I'm just, hey, yo, I was 
out there. I, I switched to M4 for a, a MacBook Pro. I never looked back, just like y'all. So, you know, if I could do it, you can do it. And then let me, you know, let me put you guys in a team. And then mm -hmm. we're going to work together in a team. And we're going to hurry up and assess each other's uh, strengths and weaknesses. And then based upon your strengths and weaknesses, we can bring in other mentors. And based upon the things that you love and enjoy, I'm going to bring in people that can talk to you mm -hmm. and just keep that type of um communal ecosystem and right so mm -hmm. i like you know we have people who are who love css and love ux we have people who love just you know dealing with api serverless and i try to you know see i try to quickly identify it's almost like a you know the 360 of a battlefield i'm always trying to th um perpendicularly uh th like cyclically uh, in a cyclical manner uh identify what they love and what they're having problems with and try to like fill the gaps of those so that's like, like i said i have i i have an unfair advantage because i think move and communicate mm. like them right so yeah, yeah, and a yeah. lot of places don't have that so let me ask this then uh, zainab how important is it that people who are into tech and beginning see people who are their people because jerome has just described a really welcoming environment that you know and i'll be honest with you, jerome doesn't speak to me right? Because I never served and thank you for your service. But I'm hearing that that's what they need. How important is it saying that for people to see people that look like them in tech? I think you may be muted. <laughs> My bad. Yep. Um, it's absolutely important. Um, I think the idea of belonging goes such a long way, right? Um, because this industry and just coding in general is seen as something that's very hard, that takes a lot of focus, that takes a lot of energy, and that sometimes we struggle with a lot of imposter syndrome, right? Like knowing that someone like me can do it is such a huge boost, right? Um, specifically because of that anxiety that comes with, you know, doing something that's really hard. Um, I kind of, you know, share in like a, an example when I got started. Um, to learn how to code, it was extremely um, intimidating because I was the only woman and woman of color in my classes, right? I did not see any people like me that had my interests in the industry either. And so I, you know, tiptoed around it and I had a lot of mental blocks. And I think that a lot of times it has to do with that um, mental block that doesn't allow us to like either do well in the interview process or that doesn't allow us to like get our um, energy and focus to start a project. Cause I remember when I was early on in my career, I would hear a lot of advice about like, oh, you need to build, you know, build some um, projects on the side and that's gonna boost your resume or you should be studying two hours a day. And I couldn't do it. I struggled so much with it because I just felt like I was, I, I just didn't have the capacity, right? And it wasn't until I started feeling more comfortable in my skin that those things started to come so easily. And so a lot of, of the belonging is so important because it, it gives you a safe place to start. Hmm. And so I think that's why representation is so important because it gives you a safety pad. Like, oh, this person did it, then maybe I can do it too, right? And, and you don't have to feel that anxiety that you have to always um, be performing or um, you have to um, convince yourself and others that you belong in this place. That statement that you made that uh, that someone says, well, you know, she did it, I can do it. And if I see that person, I can do it. I don't want me doing it to make someone feel like they explicitly can't. Like, for example, when I go to family get togethers, I'm the computer person. And there's something about me or my style or whatever, because I have more of a classic nerd thing with the Star Wars and the whatnot and the LEDs and the video games. They go, oh, he's a computer person. You know, mm. he's a computer person. Like very early, we get split into computer people and not computer people. And I don't like that. I want to normalize normal people coding. And whenever someone, you know, I say, oh, I'm a computer person. And then that immediately frames our relationship such that they go and flip the, I'm not a techie. But but you are like you use Excel and you do great things with Word and you you know do macros in Photoshop like maybe you're more technical than you give yourself credit for you know what can we do in the community to be more welcoming to those people Jerome you look mm -hmm. like you have something that you want to add yeah um, I've been thinking about that a lot um, my solution to this is normalizing people bringing their entire self to work and not just when it like 
benefits the company, right? We've had a lot, especially the past two years being a minority, we've had a lot of conversations around Black Lives Matter and being able to bring your whole self to work. But as you've been seeing, of course, the past year, companies have started to take that back because it's a lot harder than, you know, throwing a black square on Instagram or a black band banner. So the first thing that we have to do is just allow people to be their whole self. Like, you know, if you see me on Twitter, twice a day, I'm talking about cooking recipes, right? Because that's what I like to think about when uh, that, that helps me get my brain working better than thinking about code, right? Like, you know, oh, I wonder how caviar fried rice would go. Um, and you get people if, like saying like, stay in your lane, Jerome. I came here for the tech. I don't want to hear about your oh, recipes. Well, I think that's like I said, I'm, it's very hard because of my background. No one really tries to gatekeep me because they're like, yo, this dude <laughs> has a purple heart. Who am I going to like tell this dude that what he can and can't do? So uh, it's very, it's very weird. Right. So, but I think as a community, we just got to, let people bring their whole selves to work. Like I love going on Twitter and finding all the other random things out about people. Like I, you know, Air Fryer Nation, right? With Angie, right? That's amazing. Like all these people. Angie on fire Jones, now. of course. Angie is, Jones is a like, very famous uh, developer and uh, tester and international speaker who also has a cult of people who love air frying. Uh, and they've even made t-shirts, right? And that's a really great example though, that we as a community need to be welcoming to people and all of their diverse diverse interests. I know, Saran, that when you founded Code Newbies, that was really, really important to make it so everyone could be interested in all the things that they're interested in. You are normalizing normal people coding. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and Jerome, I totally love your point about seeing uh, different people and bringing them their whole selves. One of my favorite people to follow on Instagram is April. I can't remember her last name right now, um, but she's Vogue and Code on the internet. She works for Microsoft and she, uh, I just love her Instagram because she's, uh, I think she's a developer relations uh, person, I think. She does uh, virtual reality now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And she's talking about her, um, you know, her plants and her fashion. She she sews her own clothes, these beautiful designs and how she, you know, organizes her office. And I think she just moved to a new house. And it's just so much fun seeing someone who's highly technical, written books about Python, you know, does so many great, you know, hardcore, quote unquote, code things being just a normal person. And for us at Code Newbie, for us where that really, uh, we've tried to kind of emphasize that is in the podcast. We have a show called the Code Newbie Podcast. We've done hundreds of episodes over the last six, seven years now. And when we pick the guests, when we pick who we want to showcase on the show, we go for people who are normal, <laughs> people who represent all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, people who started as babysitters and teachers. And, you know, one of our most popular episodes was a truck driver who learned how to had a code, you know, in between, um, you know, driving trucks and on little breaks and late at night. And just saying that, you know, normal people, people with regular jobs with, you know, maybe a little bit more humble beginnings can get started. And by showcasing such a wide range of people, you know, a nice array of people, you're able to send home the message that, hey, there is no archetype. There is no one right way to do it. There is no single path. Uh, everyone is different and this place is welcoming to all. So for us, it's been storytelling. That's been our primary tool. That's great. Doesn't it seem like that, that open source and Linux and JavaScript and open code is really like should be a place where people go to get involved in tech. Like the, it is on the open source community to be like, hey, like the whole point of all of this was free code and free, you know, free knowledge and all these kinds of things. This should be the community that people go to, uh, to, uh, to get involved in technology. Saying that when you are coaching people to be, uh, to, you know, to go and get jobs, to go and do interviews and things like that, uh, does open source matter on their resumes? 100%. I actually think that that is a great opportunity to showcase your, um, your skills, but also your drive, right? It shows that, that you care about someone else's project or that you care about a community and to build it. And it is a huge booster in someone's resume, especially if you're just getting started with your career. So that is definitely somewhere that I try to like point people towards. But I will say that a lot of people kind of feel intimidated by that as well, you know? And I think it has to do with the fact that we are 
probably scared of like making mistakes, right? Like if I open a pull request on some, you know, uh, open source project, what if I get, you know, rejected? What if uh, someone, you know, is criticizing the way that I'm approaching this? And so I think there's definitely a need for creating a little bit more of an incentive for people to feel okay with like, you don't have to get everything right. You know, you don't have to get everything perfect. And it's about uh, the intention and um, just getting ourselves out there. Um, yeah. That's a callback a little bit to that uh, that statement that I made a little bit ago where I said, people need a welcoming place to fail. That's the number one thing at Microsoft where I work that we feel that, that the early in career people say that they don't feel comfortable failing because mm -hmm. they think they have to be perfect. They were perfect their whole lives to get to this place. And now they're at this big, scary company and they need to do just the right thing. And I would really like them to be able to fail quickly, you know, yeah. hopefully without costing billions of dollars uh, as fast as possible. And they always like, how do you know this, Scott? How do you know this obscure thing? Well, many years ago when I failed very, very quickly, I learned this thing, this semicolon that just spent six hours debugging. And now you too know this stuff. Like that's how we get this, these stories, right? Of stories of failure. Uh, that's my favorite thing. Like um, they just put me on a project at Microsoft and I was like, oh, I'm gonna mess this up. I'm gonna let y'all know that right now. <laughs> and, and everybody was like, well, at least you run it. So I was like, yeah, I'm a, you know, you have to, like I said, with the whole idea of grace, like, but it starts with yourself, right? People, they get in their own heads, right? And they are trying to live up to an unrealistic viewpoint of themselves. I'm like, you know, I try to, I, I tell my veterans that all the time. I'm like, did you forget how crazy it was going through basic? You were not you before you were in basic you were to the military a horrible version of civilian that had to get molded into who you currently are now so don't think about it in that in the scope that you have to be perfect i was like no they literally trained you and taught you how to do things that's how it's going to be now when we apply that to community like one thing that i love the best that i learned from the military is you know i call it I, you know two things crawl walk run and buddy system. So when I when I'm in open source and I'm helping my veterans, it's always first thing I do is I connect them to someone who has more experience in this than them, and I try to make projects that can help them uh, grow in open source as well as you know not intimidate them. You know, I've I've learned a lot about onboarding and open source over the past six years because of you know I you know I've seen it all the bad things I've seen all the good things. So I'm like you know what. You know, these are things that you need to you need to find when you're going to open source like community. Just find a first find something that you actually enjoy and then turn around and see, yo, know, where can I help? And just start talking to people. You'd be amazed how much, you know, you will learn just doing that. And a lot of people don't think about that. You know, coding is a social game and you have to get in there. Mm -hmm and start thinking and aspects of these are people behind code, right? Companies, they don't think like that for the most part, but you know, when it comes to open source, you can do that, particularly in JavaScript where, you know, because of, you know, React and the VA engine, we kind of democratized coding because we went from the toy language and to like flipped into like, oh, this is one of the fastest growing <laughs> production level languages on the planet. Like, how did that happen, right? This was something made in, two weeks, how on earth, like who wrote, like who would have said that this is gonna be a thing? Like- it's Not the language like, we deserve, but it is the language that we have. In yeah, remaining, like who had this on a bingo card? Yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, and that's the idea that we, you yeah. have to have, right? I appreciate I, I kinda, that. Uh, sorry, please, in the remaining two minutes, if we could have uh, Zainab, maybe you could offer your last minute uh, as we oh, head out. I please. almost feel like I'm just gonna open a whole different tangent, but I just wanna point out that We've been talking about being able to fail and, and not necessarily not needing to be perfect, right? And being okay with not being perfect. And I feel like there's a huge failure in how we evaluate technical uh, skills in the interview process, right? The technical interview process does not allow for any margin of error. Right. And so here we are talking about what it takes to be a good developer. And it's all about, you know, embracing those failures and learning yet. For some, for some reason, we've standardized an interview process and a technical assessment that does not allow for that. That does not allow for people to show their true colors, to be able to bring their whole self, to show of other skills, you know, and to show that they actually can learn and that they can actually build on previous knowledge, right? And so I think that that's a huge um, 
thing that as a tech industry, we still need to get right. And it's like the interview process itself, how we interview for tech cha for tech, um, for tech skills. Mm -hmm. Saran, any parting thoughts as we head out to the end of our half an hour? Um, sure. I think that, you know, my parting thoughts are that uh, even though we have a, a long way to go in terms of where we are in the tech industry and being more inclusive and being uh, kinder and just a better place to work, I think we're definitely headed in the right direction. I've been really optimistic, especially in the last couple of years of seeing, as I mentioned, the early career developer, you know, name change, um, this idea of, you know, pushing back against burnout and really embracing self-care and mental health. And I feel like we are getting to a place where we are including more people and we are bringing people in. And that uh, is because of individuals, it's because of individual people who decided to be kind, decided to be open, decided to be welcoming. So I hope uh, I hope each of you feel empowered to, to take on a little bit of that responsibility and making coding a better place to be. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate you all. Uh, Saranya Bark, uh, founder of Code Newbies, Jerome Hardaway from Vets Who Code, Zainab Ebrahimi from Flourish, and uh, I have been your host, Scott Hanselman, also the host of the Hanselman It's podcast. And we've appreciated you hanging out with us here, and we hope you have a great conference at OpenJS World 2021. Goodbye. <laughs>